Welcome to Blackstone Book Talks, a podcast featuring exclusive interviews from Blackstone's bookish network of authors, narrators, and special guests. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to welcome you to today's Blackstone Book Talk, The Wild World of Crime Fiction, with two of our crime fiction writers, Jeffrey Fleischman and Will Staples. So just to give a brief introduction, so Will Staples is a critically acclaimed screenwriter who writes movies, television series, video games, and books. He's worked on such films as Without Remorse and the Mission Impossible franchise. His television work includes Jack Ryan in the Shooter series, um, as well as adapting Tom Wolfe's book, The Right Stuff for Disney+. He's also written numerous hit video games, including Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. And his paperback, which we're going to be discussing today, um, his book, Animals, went on sale in paperback uh, this spring. And I'm so excited to hear about it more today. Um, and our other writer is Jeffrey Fleischman, who is a Pulitzer Prize finalist and longtime foreign correspondent. He's had postings in Rome, Berlin, and Cairo, and has covered wars in Iraq, Libya, and Kosovo. He returned to America in 2014 and is currently the foreign and national editor of the Los Angeles Times. He's written four other novels, including My Detective and uh, Last Dance, which are the two first books in the Sam Carver series. Um, so... Uh, Jeff, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, well, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, and um, I then got into writing this series sort of as a, I had written a couple of books before and I was intrigued by wanting to get into the crime, uh, mm -hmm. crime noir genre since I had moved to Los Angeles and it's such a, such a haven for that kind of food, uh, feel and mood. And I wanted to explore Los Angeles through that lens. So that's sort of what brought me here to the last book in the uh, in the Carver trilogy. You know, I initially started out on the, the film side and then from there branched out into video games and television. Um, and this was a story that I had spent so much time with and lived with for so long um, that when it seemed like it could take a while to mount the film or television series version of it. I decided to reimagine it as a book and uh, the rest is history and had a great time with it and, and really enjoyed it. I think we both, I mean, I, in, in reading Animals, which is a terrific book and in, and in, uh, and in, and in, my, in the Carver series, I mean, we both spent a lot of time with our subjects or our subject matter. Uh, and I think for, for me, I wanted to try to, capture Los Angeles in moments that I saw. So the first book in the series, My Detective, deals with the, the backdrop is the architecture of Los Angeles. Uh, and the, the, the killer who becomes Sam Carver's ne nemesis, Dylan Cross, is an architect. So I want to explore the, the changing architecture of downtown LA as I was living it in real time. And then the second book, Last Dance, deals with more of the Hollywood aspect, intrigue, uh, post-Cold War, uh, Hollywood and uh, and Los Angeles and 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 also the world of ballet, uh, which which um, I befriended a, a number of people at the American uh, Contemporary Ballet, and they let me sort of into their world, and I was able to study that. And, and one of the main characters in the in Last Dance is uh, is a ballerina. And finally, for Good Night Forever, I, I, I wanted to put it against the backdrop of of homelessness and race. And other and other questions, not only of Los Angeles but of but of America. So, and and ultimately, these three books. I found out sort of after I finished them all and looked back. It's really a, it's, it's a it's a twisted, demented, delusional love story of two people, killer and cop, uh, set against different different backgrounds of, of Los Angeles as it was changing. And I know you know, and and in um, animals, well, you I thought when I when I was reading, I said maybe you started out as doing an investigative journalism piece because you really delved into some pretty, some pretty important topical issues uh, about it. So I was really impressed by that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, the, the research for animals was, it was crazy. I mean, it went to seven different countries on three different continents. Even before that, I'd interviewed a hundred different people from like NGOs to government agencies and, and things like that. And then, um, and then the actual field research doing undercover black market buys um, and going on anti-poaching operations and things uh, got pretty hectic. It was definitely uh, it was something I, this relates to something I wanted to ask you about, but I found that the research for animals uh, took me psychologically to some pretty dark places. And I think it took me a while afterwards 
to sort of come out of the hole that I found myself in after going through those experiences. Um, and that also was the motivator for when it seemed like I had a story that seven people who had experienced it, you know, I, I originally uh, dreamed it up as a movie, the pe people loved it, and but it wasn't getting out there. And the idea that these things that were so important to me weren't being expressed um, on a broader on a broader stage and that I had potentially a toolkit to do that was really a motivator to, to try and put all that information out there in the form of the story. I mean, I was curious, you know, reading Goodnight Forever, one of the things that really stuck with me is you touch on a lot of very disturbing issues. You know, like, for example, you talk about, um, you know, white supremacist hate groups and, you know, things like the Turner Diaries and hate music and things like that. And in your book, you talk about how the characters in the book are emotionally impacted by that. And I was wondering to what extent uh, you were impacted by those things and to what extent you put a piece of yourself in your characters when you're writing them. Yeah, I, I think with, uh, with Carver, uh, that, that he see, he's very interior, but he, but he, he very much feels uh, the, the, what's happening in the outside world and the world around him. I think, I think like you, I, I like to have my characters being, being involved in their interior moments and in their inner lives and their immediate lives around them, but they live in a big, big world. And sometimes that world is, is threatening, fascinating, maddening, and, and lovely. So I, I like to, and maybe that's part of the journalist in me too, but I like to connect my characters to, to larger themes. And so I live in downtown Los Angeles and um, you, can't, you can't escape the, the tragedy of the homelessness down here. And it, it just seems to get, there's no end in sight to it and it's block after block. And I think I really wanted to, and Good Night Forever, capture that. I mean, the, 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 this, the, one of the subplots of the book is Sam Carver is investigating murders in the homeless community. And, um, and so I wanted to, to really get into that because I see it up close and in, in front every day. So yeah, that, when you're seeing it like that and then writing it, you're trying to process it. And it, it certainly bothers you on an emotional or psychological level because you leave Skid Row and then you come back to your apartment and you look out over the window eye and you try to put words to this very ugly, um, almost surreal thing sometimes. So I think you're, we're always going back and forth on that. And I imagine you had the same you know, some of the things you witnessed in, in putting together animals. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what I was most struck by, and it sounds like there's a bit of it too for you with the homeless issue and some of the other issues, is that I, as a random guy from Hollywood, was able to go and get deep inside these areas where these criminal organizations operate and was able to document all sorts of international crimes happening, you know, videotaping like undercover buys that I was doing, um, you know, and even DNA testing the samples I got to make sure everything was legit. And that information is the sort of thing that if it was human trafficking or arms dealing or narco trafficking would go straight to a law enforcement agency and something would presumably happen, but nobody cares about the issue. And so it's like in animals, you know, it's like, I'm talking about places like Mong Wa, the King's Roman casino. Um, you know, like when I talk about characters going to like a bear farm in this location or the tiger farm in Tekek, like those are all real places. Any reader could just go tomorrow and nobody's going to stop them yet. It continues to happen out in the open. Um, and I think that the sort of futility of that was, was really shocking to me. I think, I guess like I sort of view, I, I come from a background of doing like blockbuster entertainment. So I, I tend to be like, maybe I can hide the peas in the mashed potatoes and write like a really, ideally compelling crime th thriller that after people read it will come away with some of the deeper questions that I've been exploring. Um, but yeah, so anyways, not to go on and on, but. Did you was, consider, I, had a, I had a question though for, for you on that, on that note, I think. Did you consider, um, given that you're in, in film too and you were witnessing so much, did you consider a documentary or, or some other way to tell the story or were you definitely determined to do it for a novel at the outset? Uh, well, I was determined initially as a film when I was doing the research. So I got Warner Brothers to pay for all the research for it. And they still control the film and television rights to the book. Um, but so they, basically, when I, initially I got hired. I'll, the, I'll do the shortest version of what would otherwise be a very long story. Basically, there's three stars who want to do an animal trafficking movie. I, through a strange confluence of events, uh, 
was put up as somebody who knew a lot about animal trafficking by a friend in that world, uh, which I did not. And I got hired to do it. And then I was like, oh my God, I've got to learn about this issue now that I really know nothing about and don't have a strong point of view about. Um, and it turned out that very few people do because there's no law enforcement money put into investigating animal crimes. And so um, I was like, okay, I've got to find a way to learn this, or I'm just going to write something that's total BS that doesn't do any service to the issue. Uh, and so it turned out one of the actors was Leonardo DiCaprio. And it turns out that there was this uh, Swiss journalist, documentary filmmaker, Carl Amon, who had been reaching out repeatedly to them because he was interested in investigating tigers. And Leonardo's philanthropic issue is uh, tiger conservation as well. Um, and so they had never connected with Carl, but they said, hey, if you want to talk to this dude, Carl, uh, he might be able to help you learn about the issue. And so I reached out to Carl and it turned out coincidentally, Carl was about to leave on this whirlwind tour of the golden triangle with this network of local fixers that he had. And he was like, if you can just pay your own way, I'll show you everything I know. And so I actually ended up uh, partnering with Carl who was filming this very rough fly by night documentary at the time. Um, and then, you know, the book, all the money from the book goes to animal charities. And when Carl was making his doc, I helped out pro bono writing and exec producing um, the documentary, which exposes the sort of, uh, Golden Triangle as the, the hub of uh, distribution syndicates for animal parts. Uh, and so that, that documentary is out in Europe right now. It's called The Tiger Mafia. Um, and, you know, it's gotten some traction, but, you know, it's a lot of like shaky handy cam footage of, you know, me and Carl doing these undercover buys and things like that. So it's pretty wild. Um, when you were writing Good Night Forever, I was curious, like to what extent you as a writer know the ending when you begin because the ending felt so right to the book um and whether you you know what that last sentence is going to be or if you're somebody who writes in order and then when you get there you discover it uh i knew how um i knew how the book was going to end i didn't know in exactly what fashion or what the but i but i had a i had a sense of uh, there has to be the first book um my detective Deals with uh, Dylan Cross uh, has killed uh, has killed a number of men and carvers on the case, and it's told in first person uh, in alternating chapters. So you're directly in the mind of, of cop and killer, and through that you're getting even though they've never met, uh, they there's a, you you feel a connection between them. Dylan basically feels that Carver, like her, is a broken character in a much larger uh, set piece. And she thinks that she'll understand her motivations for killing these men. And he in part does, but he brings his own brokenness to the scene. So through his trying to chase her, uh, they, get to, they get to know one another. Uh, she's hacked his computer. She's done all these things where she can pay attention to him. Um, the, the Good Night Forever, I mean, uh, My Detective ends where, I, I don't want to get too much away, but it ends where she basically escapes. Uh, in the second book, uh, Last Dance, Carver's consumed with the, the murder of, the, of a ballerina and some Cold War, post-Cold War intrigue and a famous Hollywood producer who was once a Russian spy. And Dylan uh, haunts that book. You don't see her, she doesn't make an appearance until the very end, but she, she's in Carver's head all the time. So no matter what he's doing, he's contemplating her. So in Good Night Forever, I had to bring it to fruition. And so I knew that the end of the book will be the the, the final uh, showdown between, uh, between Carver and Dylan. And then it was just picking the themes I wanted to to, to navigate my, my way there. Because I knew that they had to have just a moment for them, a sustained period in, toward the end of the book where they had to let their demons out, in, in, inhale each other demons and, and see what, what happened. One of the... I, one of the things, one of the ways I interpreted your book relative to my book, I was curious to get your thoughts on is that I was really struck by the, the way your characters were drawn and that in animals, you're presented with a number of characters who have plans for their life. They have a sense of where their life is supposed to go and what the journey will look like. And those plans are interrupted by the events of the story. I felt reading Good Night Forever like these were characters who were kind of like human flotsam, right? Like I didn't get the sense that Sam Carver woke up and, you know, had dreams of like walking his daughter down the aisle or that the other characters 
had a sense of a prolonged future. I mean, there's a there's a, a sense of obsession and fantasy about potential moments and interactions, but it really felt like the characters live so much in the present tense in the story. I, th I think that that's because that um, they right outside of them is this electricity of things that can end their lives or, or completely send them on a different trajectory. So Carver's sort of a, an existentialist. You know, he he cares about the world and he and he sees its damage. And, and I, I, obviously through being a detective, he sees the worst of humanity. So he doesn't. Um, with his love interest in, in, in Last Dance, he almost feels that there is a way forward. Like I could have kids or I could do this, but it's only a fleeting moment because then he's back to his darker self and the darker things he's trying to do. So I do, I do think, um, and, and same thing with his, his boss and, and, uh, and, uh, and other characters in the book, there's a good word, flotsam, right? they're living amid this, this very, dreary, sometimes violent, sometimes kinetic, sometimes there's also a rush to it uh, for them. And, and so they're trying to, at the end of the day, they're, they're kind of exhausted <laughs> because of uh, just, trying to, just trying to absorb it all. I think Carver in a lot of ways is just uh, out there on his own, trying to figure out the world and, and, and come to peace with things that happened in his life and how to move forward at the same time He's colliding with Dylan Cross, who's trying to figure out the same things, but under a much more violent and dangerous uh, uh, operandi. And so as a correspondent, you've obviously interacted with a lot of people in various agencies, law enforcement, things like that. Is there, is Sam Carver related to some particular experience or individual that you cross paths with, or is Carver a, a pure construction uh, for you? I think he's pretty much a, a pure construction. Uh, uh, we, we borrow we're like magpies, right? We borrow little things here and there and subconsciously they probably come to fruition and, and hopefully in the right ways when we write. But I, I noticed with, with Carver and um, I mean, he's very much like Cobus. I mean, these are guys damaged by things and they're trying to figure it out and they, they, they're carrying this damage into, into their present day and they're trying to live with it. I mean, I, I found some similarities there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Cobus was interesting because he was very much related to a particular individual that I knew who was really struggling with the futility of the work. Um, and as I was trying to figure out how to bring that character to life, I just I went to that guy and I was like, what's the worst thing you can imagine doing uh, to protect animals? And he was like, I would poison the supply and I'd probably end up killing a lot of people along the way who don't deserve to die. But it would potentially help reduce demand. And I was like, that is so dark. And that is exactly where I want to take this character. So that's uh, commitment, commitment on a whole other level, right? Yeah, I mean, and then, you know, I, I found that like, and I found there was definitely a piece of my, I, I, if I were to look at the three or four main characters and animals, I could tell you that like, there's a facet of me that is drawn in bold relief in each character, right? Like. Cobus is this guy who's struggling with how do you tackle this issue that just seems wildly insurmountable and that nobody seems to care about. And then, you know, the Knight character, for example, is a guy who likes to think of himself as somebody who's on the side of helping animals. And, you know, he's, he's making a buck at it, but he's aligned with the interests of the natural world or so he thinks at the beginning of the story. And his sort of having to deal with the fact that we are all complicit in the destruction of wildlife and the animal world, no matter how good we think we are, you know, it's like, we're all flying planes. We're all wearing leather shoes. I mean, some of us are not, but it's like, it's very hard to be totally pure and have clean hands when it comes to that issue. Um, I like the night character a lot because I love, I love the opening scene when we first meet him because he's immediately looking at things uh, through the eye of value. Uh, right. What, what, yeah. what is, what is, what is this worth to the world? And uh, it, it's, it's such a nice construction of, of what, where he's headed. I think it's a model or something he's sitting with and yeah. also what her shelf life is going to be. Yeah. But it's, 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 you can see that exactly why he's is like he is. Though. Yeah. I mean, I sort of tried to have him be like a bit of a, you know, uh, elements of like Rick from Casablanca, you know, this guy who's like sort of, 
cruising along, doesn't stick his neck out for nobody. Um, and, and, you know, the ways that we tell ourselves that we're not part of the problem. And then one day we wake up and we realize we are. And it's like, I think that was something that really impacted me writing animals is like evaluating moments in my own life where I'd say, Oh, wow. I didn't, it didn't occur to me that this thing I'm doing is having a really negative impact on the natural world. And then having the follow-up thought that I'm probably not going to change my behavior because I enjoy whatever it is that I was doing. And that's, that's sort of like a, a dark messed up thing to challenge yourself on obviously. And, and it was interesting to explore that in the characters. Um, and, you know, I, I knew I write, I don't know about, I'm curious to get your um, reaction to this. I write completely out of order. Like for me, it's all about, for me, the story is all about servicing the moment, like the moment, you know, like what are those big visceral emotional moments that I'm trying to bring to life? You know, I, I knew the last sentence of the book, uh, probably within the first week of writing it. Um, and then I would jump around and, and know that there was some other scene that ha happened because the themes of the story demanded that that theme would be drawn in most bold relief in this type of moment. Um, but that's, I think that's me coming from being a Hollywood guy where, you know, movies and TV are all about moments because uh, audiences remember moments, not story. Um, but it sounds like you write, you write sequentially, right? Like you start at page one and then you move through the book. Right. I, I, I don't do an outline. I, I'm, uh, I know some, some writers who do the note cards and the outlines and the, and the whiteboard. I, I don't do any of that. I have, I come at with a character first. Character is always first. And, and then setting and, and, and movement come. But I need to get my head around a character and then I try to go through a first chapter pretty fast, just getting the movement and propulsion going. And then, and then about a third of the way through the book, I, I, begin, I begin seeing the ending uh, and I know, and it really starts to fall into place. And then sometimes I have to go back to the first third of it and, and rejigger it or reconstruct it a little bit. So it has that momentum going through the middle section of the book, which can be deadly if you don't do it right, you know, because you need that, as you were saying, you need those moments. And I, I my, my, uh, my editor on, on, uh, on Good Night Forever gave me this great advice. He said, yeah, we're, we're moving along good, but, and this was in the, I think the first edit we got through, and he goes, we're moving along good, but Jeff, I gotta tell you, pretty soon, someone's got to get killed or laid. <laughs> so it was, but it was, it, was, it was his way of saying, you know, let's, let's uh, speed it up a little bit, but it was uh, his vernacular. So I think, I think once you get that tension going back and forth, it becomes, then I think it becomes a, a real fun game because you're, hopefully you've developed your character, you, you know he or she so well, and you can place them in these situations uh, that eventually in the editing, you'll pare down or, 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 or spruce up a bit, but, but you're there. But so, all right. So when you're, you're sitting down, you're thinking, all right, it's time for book three, good night forever. Here is where Carver has been. And this is, these are the things that he's grappling with in life with himself. Are you, do you know at that point, here's the here's the the worst ringer i could put this guy through and i know that i want to put him through that ringer or you start writing and then you discover that along the way this one when it, after after finishing the second book last dance i knew that carver's ringer was going to be what ultimately happened between he and dylan and who was going to survive that uh because i knew only one of them was going to survive it and so um that all of Good Night Forever is a lead up to that. And, and what I wanted to do though too is, as I said, with the, the homelessness and the, and the race issues and the white supremacy is put him in this other world that, uh, that in its own way was so ugly and mesmerizing and unsolvable it seemed, but still he throws himself into it. I mean, Carver's all about, okay, it's bad, it's terrible out there, but, but you go into it. And sometimes you find humor in going into it. And sometimes you find, complete heartbreak and sometimes there are no words. I mean, that's why I have Carver, he, he plays the piano. He, he has a friend at, uh, at, at, the, at the Little Easy Bar and they talk about things. Those are his little sort of momentary outlets so he, where he lets his guard down. Um, and, then he's, and then he's sort of back in the race as it were. Interesting, and do you, 
have a North star thematically when you're approaching the material. Like for me, when I'm writing, there's that, I spend a lot of time trying to distill. So I do all the research, gather all the facts. And I'm like, okay, what, if I look at all this, what's this about? What's the important thing to say about this? I mean, fortunately for animals, Jane Goodall had already said it when she said the greatest danger of our future is apathy. Cause that, that codified everything that I was experiencing externally and internally about the issue, um, you know, or, uh, you know, adapting a true crime story right now from 1980. And that one, it took me a while, but I arrived at like, when the world is broken, it drives the people in it to their breaking point. And then that echoes throughout every moment in the story. When you're writing, you know, it, it, I get the sense in Goodnight Forever that there were a lot of different social issues that you wanted to touch on. Was there a, a central thesis to it? Uh, the, the, uh, in, in all three books, I, I, I wanted to make LA its own character. So a lot of it has to do with, um, uh, a lot of this has to do with um, looking looking at Los Angeles through through the lens of I moved here in 2014, and I, and I, as I was writing these books, I was discovering Los Angeles. And one of the the wonderful things I I discovered about Los Angeles is that is it's undefinable. It resists any kind of any kind of thing a writer wants to put on it is either sounds cliche or, or trying too hard or whatever. It just, it defies description. And that's the beauty of it, right? That elusive quality is the beauty of what I find so attracting of it. I'll wake up one morning and see something just like, I think this is a third world the city. And then, and then I'll look, I'll, I'll look left to the San Gabriel mountains and I'll say, no, wait a minute. And then I'll, it, it's constantly tugging at your perceptions of what it is. And, and, it, and then that context who you are as you navigate through it. And that's, that's what I wanted to make it for Carver. Uh, he's going through this, this city and he's trying to define its landscape and architecture at the same time. He's trying to heal his wounds and understand not only his life, but the lives around him and why he's a cop and why he does what he does. And so, and Los Angeles is that mirror for him. Uh, yeah, it was the locations in particular are so vivid in your book that I was like, a few times I was like, like for example, uh, last weekend I was driving down um, the, the Pita, Highway 1, so I grew up in Monterey and you know take the family up there frequently. I was driving down and I passed uh, I think it was Ragged Point. And I was like, is this one of the locations in Jeff's books? I feel like I'm looking right at it. He didn't say it in the book, but it was, you know, I was like, I feel like it's, it's matching the description. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I, in, in, I, I love one of the things I really like to do is, is go out and, and try to describe things we see every day, but in a different way. Like you put your, like all writers do, right? You want to put, you want to make the familiar unique uh, and the unique familiar so you, 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 ha you can connect the reader. And uh, along, si along similar lines, I was wondering in, when you're putting together um, animals and, and the vast sort of geography that you're, that you're um, compiling, how did you, and maybe that's part of you were talking about moments in TV and screenwriting, but the propulsion of it keeps moving and you are traveling different time zones. How did you choreograph all that as you're keeping the, keeping intimate to the characters, talking to a large issue of, you know, what's happening to animals and then moving us from city to place to place. Yeah, it was, it was brutal. I mean, I, I tend to find that there is an emotional roller coaster to me for the writing process of I come along an idea, I'm very excited about it. I do the research, I get more excited about it. I find the meaning of the piece. Now I'm incredibly excited about it. And I try and figure out how to externalize that meeting in a story format. And then I like curl up in bed and suck my thumb and feel sorry for myself for a long time. And all, you know, and all those feelings of of it being an impossible mountain to climb. And then at some point the clouds part and the euphoria of writing sets in where it's like all of a sudden you feel like you're in your groove um, before the editing process. Um, right. But I found with animals, you know, it was very important to me. You know, I, I've done a lot of work on various projects with illicit markets and there's always sort of the three segments. There's the production segment, you know, whether you're talking, if you're talking about cocaine, it's like, you know, farms in Bolivia and Colombia and places like that with animals um, that's primarily poaching in Africa 
Then there's the distribution layer, um, which nobody really knows about the animals, which is all these hubs in Southeast Asia. And then the consumption in places like China or, um, you know, or other uh, places where people have money to spend on these goods. And so it was very important to me to construct a story that would traverse all of those aspects of the animal trade um, and not just do something. You, know, you can, you can't really throw a rock in South Africa and airports without hitting 10 books about poaching, which is such a small piece of the story. It's a very digestible piece of the story, but I found, I really wanted to see, okay, how does this tentacle out from Southeast Asia, all these places. So it was really then just, how do I find three characters or the right characters to traverse those places but also then braid them together quickly enough that it doesn't feel like I'm just telling an, a sort of an anthology of different stories in the animal trade. And so it was a real crazy challenge with a lot of note cards and whiteboarding and self-loathing uh, of trying to figure out how to braid those stories together. And then every now and then I'd feel like it was all working and I'd realize that like this event happened three months after this event in the story <laughs> and then go back to the drawing board. Um, what but, was the biggest uh, revelation you had? And that you didn't expect going into it? Uh, I think, well, I think how much it would impact me for sure, but it really was the fact that it is a very solvable issue that nobody wants to solve. Um, specifically, okay, if you look at like arms dealers, right? Like Victor Boot, that dude was all about arms dealing. He was not going to stop arms dealing because uh, some foreign government didn't want to do it. Or if you look at, uh, you know, the Zetas or whatever cartel, like they are hard, like their business is drugs. They can't, they can never stop. With animal trafficking, the cartels that are involved in distribution are, uh, that their core business is distribution. They'll distribute anything. And a lot of their business is synthetic drugs, uh, opium, uh, women, and then they run these massive gambling operations in these areas, these black hole regions that the world isn't really aware of existing. Um, and so it's it really a small percentage of their operation is animal money. So as a research, it was super dark because I'd go into like the King Drummond Casino for a tiger bank with it. And there'd be like underage prostitutes and narco traffickers and all sorts of crazy stuff going on. But it occurred to me like, with some international pressure, I think those organizations would shut down the animal piece of their operation because it's really just a little side thing that they're not being punished for. Um, but the countries where they're operating are very corrupt countries where they're in bed with politicians that the US is trying to make inroads with. And so when you sort of weigh US foreign policy interests in Southeast Asia, for example, against our interest in saving animals, I think the animals sort of get ignored. You know, like we, for example, when we were in Laos, we came across uh, a sun bear on the side of the road um, in captivity, highly illegal. We reached out to save the bears in Laos and they basically said, look, you know, everybody knows that bear belongs to this politician. Like we can't do anything about it or we'll get kicked out of the country. And so that was just, I think the fact that it's all sort of known and I think we could shut it down, but nobody's really bothering with it was, was pretty frustrating. I think one of the reasons I wanted to shine a light on the issue and get the book out as wide as possible um, was because I feel like if people were aware of how screwed up the things that are going on are, uh, they might be motivated to try and change things. I mean, cause like the bear farming and stuff, I mean, the most horrifying thing I saw was, was the bear farm. Um, I mean, I, I saw a lot of horrifying stuff, but it was just one of those things that really you walk out shaking and you're not really sure how to deal with it. Um, just the way the bears were being held in captivity, uh, you know, seeing a cub that was in the process of, it had just been captured and it was in the process of transitioning from the psychological place of a bear in the wild to the psychological place of a bear that will spend its life uh, pinned to the bottom of a cage with a catheter in it. Uh, so anyways, I, you know, the, I also didn't want the book though to feel like, a dark bummer, you know what I mean? And so, I mean, hopefully, hopefully when people are reading animals, it's like, it feels like a, you know, uh, an intense visceral thrill ride and one where you're eager to turn the pages and not feeling like you're being beat up with horrible things happening to animals, but it's against the backdrop of horrible things happening to animals. Um, how about for, you know, I find that in my research, I sometimes 
make choices to go to places to get information that aren't necessarily uh, the smartest choices for like my own safety. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, doing stuff on organized crime or whatever. Uh, when you're doing your work, either as a journalist or following up when you're doing your novels, do you ever find yourself in situations where you're like, man, this is, this is a little hairy. Yeah. I mean, especially as, you know, especially in, in, uh, in, in the covering, in covering wars or whatever. It's, uh, I remember once we were in, um, when, uh, remember when Colin Powell gave the, uh, the famous UN speech about, uh, about the Ansar al-Islam group tied to, you know, making, making weapons of mass destruction or biological chemical weapons in the mountains of Northern Iraq. Well, three of us had been there or three or four of us had been there for months uh, waiting for the war to happen in the mountains of Northern Iraq. And we went to this camp where he said, uh, where he said what they were making. And it was a terrorist camp and it was an, an Ansar al-Islam camp, but, and they had been trying, they'd been tracking us and trying to um, follow us the whole time we were there. And then all of a sudden they wanted to, to meet us because they knew we were American journalists and the British journalists. And they knew that, um, that once Colin Powell put their, their target, their city or their little town in the hills on the map, they were gonna get whacked with some cruise missiles. Um, so they invited us into their camp. So one contingent invited us in, but the other contingent wasn't a, didn't sign off on that order. And they were the contingent that had come from Afghanistan that had worked directly with Obama and they had escaped to Northern Iraq. So they got word that we were in the camp with cameras and other things. Uh, and they were trying to tell us we're not making any weapons of anything, you know, with this, this. And, and this other contingent starts to drive toward us. And, and one of our fixers looks and goes, he's hearing stuff. They're talking over the phone and walkie talkies. And he said, we got to get out of here now. And we said, why? Well, because those guys coming in these Range Rovers don't want you here. <laughs> so, um, so we hurried up and got in and we raced down the mountains and then incoming fire started coming in, mortar rounds and things from, uh, from the Kurdish government that was fighting these, uh, these collection of, of, of terrorists or rebels in the hill. So it was, it was quite a, you know, those kinds of moments in war happen, you know, as you know, I'm having all the time. You just have to kind of go through it, get your head around it and, um, and then go to the, go to the next day. And, uh, and always, I found myself in those situations, you're always making calculations. Like some days you'll feel very adventuresome. Uh, and then other days, maybe, depending on what happened the preceding day, you'll be much more cautious because of, uh, because of what happened, you know, whether a shell came down, you were caught in a crossfire or, or whatever. So I think you're always trying to, to navigate that. Yeah, I, for better or for worse, I rarely let my judgment get in the way of a, a good research experience. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I did have a question about how you approach the issues that you're discussing. And, you know, as a journalist, you're, gathering facts uh, and then presenting those facts to the public and letting them draw their conclusions about how we should act on those on that information. I, I didn't get the sense, I, I got the sense reading your book that there were issues that you felt urgently needed to be examined, but I also didn't get the sense that the book was prescriptive about how we as a society should navigate those issues, particularly homelessness. Right, I just wanted to, um, I just thought, uh, just putting it out there in the story. Um, every book is about, you know, Sam Carver and his ultimate destination with Dylan Cross. I mean, that is the, the whole meaning for the book. But in going through this, uh, you know, I wanted to, to bring up some issues that were surrounding me and surrounding the city all the time. But I didn't want it to be, you know, I didn't want it to be a polemic because that's the fastest way to turn somebody off. So you just kind of like, I would just like take people on a walk through Skid Row is what I was trying to do. Not making any judgments, not doing anything, just saying, here it is. Or here is, you know, here's a meeting of white supremacists, or here's the billionaire developers who, you know, fund the white supremacists, but you can't see what's behind the screen kind of thing. So, but without making any judgments at all, because I think in a novel, you, you need to do that without doing it, right? Like you were saying earlier, you need to not even disguise it you don't that's not your intent your intent is to create a world and your intent then is to let your characters loose in that world it's not to if you're going to comment on the world the characters better do it so the reader doesn't see it but still gets the point right 
Yeah. yeah. And it seems like, you know, it seems, I've always subscribed to the point of view that the job of artists is to ask questions, not answer them. And if it's to frame the question in the right way to get people thinking and then drawing their own conclusions. I mean, with animals, uh, the one, because we are all connected to the animal issue, whether we are aware of it or not, the, the big takeaway for me with that was that we all need to draw a line for what is acceptable and not acceptable to us. And the book is not prescriptive about what that line is, but if you don't draw a line, then the lines will be drawn for you. So it's like, you know, I was on a hunting podcast a couple of weeks ago and got along great with them. And, you know, these hunters have a very strong point of view about what is okay and not okay with how they interact with the natural world. And then, uh, you know, similarly, I do a lot of stuff with like vegans who have a completely different point of view about that. Um, and my goal with animals is that people uh, from any walk of life, politically, economically, et cetera, could read it and, and not feel like it's preachy, but feeling like, okay, this is what's going on. And I need to at least think about what I'm comfortable with and not comfortable with. And maybe I am comfortable with, you know, everything that's going on in the world. Maybe there's one thing that I think is really rotten. All right. And Hi. also, I, oh, go oh, ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jeff. No, I didn't go ahead. No, no, I welcome just back. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to say that there was a question that came in the chat. Um, do you mind if I interrupt and ask the no, question? No, go please. Yeah. Okay. So one of the viewers, Sarah, wants to know, where do you guys see crime fiction evolving with like the current socio-political landscape? Like, how do you see the genre evolving? That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, what, uh, one thing is I, I, I try to, uh, I, I know, I know the publishing industry is, 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 cataloged into different genres, but I try to, I try to, I hope my books are maybe part of crime, part of something else, but I don't want to be in a, in a genre because I think that to, to the writer and the reader, that's sort of limiting. Like, well, why can't a good crime novel have a lot of great other stuff in it and still be a good crime novel? Or why do we have to demarcate that way? So, but to answer, but to answer the question, I, I think it's really, interesting because I was having this conversation with somebody the other day like what felt like today in today's January 6th hearing I mean we have the president uh, attacking basically a secret service person and I mean that's that's built in novel crime espionage whatever but it's in real life so how do we compete I get writers have always had that problem and, and artists like how do you compete when your reality is so supercharged and surreal how do you make how do you mark moments in that distinctively in fiction, when you, we used to think that fiction tells the larger truth, and I still think it does, but it is going to be interesting for crime writers particularly, and how we digest these, this current moment we're in in the United States, and, and what are the real crimes and, 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 what are, and what aren't. And I think that conversation is going on with a lot of writers now as they sit down to either write about co post-COVID world, um, American politics, the divide in this country, all the things that, uh, climate change, all the things that uh, in a lot of ways are, are, are existential. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, when I'm looking at projects, I, I tend to be gravitate towards projects that are painted on a very big canvas that speak urgently to things that are going on in the world. And I, half the time that I guess I would qualify or be categorized as crime because there are certain crimes that speak very urgently to what's going on in the world right now. Like when I was approached with the um, New York Times reporting on the Eddie Gallagher story, which I'm currently developing for television, you know, there was a, this, you know, a fairly cut and dry case. When you look at the facts, the facts are not really disputed. You have nine, 19 people on a guy's team who say that a certain pattern of events happen. And you have one guy who says they're all liars, but doesn't offer a counter narrative. And then that case got sort of latched onto by both sides of the political spectrum. And it became the sort of national, this war that played out on the national stage between people who either viewed the, uh, the accused as a, the worst villain in history or as the greatest hero in history. And there was no room for nuance in the narrative. Um, and so you know, that really attracted me to talk about the perils of tribalism in American politics and American society. I like, that's something I can say. It's got a big canvas. I love it. You know, on the other hand, another thing I'm working on right now is an animated movie about an eight-year-old Inuit girl set in mythic time uh, on the North Slope. And I've spent a bunch of time with various uh, 
Inupiaq folks up in the Arctic over the last few months researching that one. And it's not, it's, you know, the closest comp would be something like Moana, but to me, it was speaking very urgently to uh, themes of conference conservation and interconnectedness in ways that I couldn't say in any other uh, space. And so I love the crime stuff, but it's always like, how is this crime a crime that can only happen now? And I think that sort of touches on what you were saying, Jeff, about, about the stuff we were witnessing today is like, this is some crazy stuff going on that we're hearing about. And whether you're speaking directly to it by exposing that crime or looking at another crime that has, that explores similar themes that can comment on how this relates to bigger things in society, that that's the stuff that gets me out of bed in the morning for sure as a writer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was, I, I, I was, uh, came across a quote the other day by um, Philip Roth, who wrote in 1961, some of the things we're talking about here, he said that, to paraphrase, he was basically saying that the American writer today is under so much pressure because he, and this is back in 61, because so much of the world seems to, beyond, to be beyond his capacity to, to distill, to write about. Um, and, and because it's all so, it, fiction has become reality for us, you know, with all the strange things happening, you know, the pre-missile crisis, Cold War, all the issues of his day, he was writing about saying, how can we as fiction writers, as novelists, uh, uh, draw readers in when what surrounds them is so compelling? Uh, and he thought that was a great challenge for the writer to be able to take that and turn it uh, and twist it and turn it into something where where the reader can stay away but it was a huge challenge for the for the artist to do uh, i see we have a question here from tracy how do you find that line between bringing awareness to an issue and being preachy i guess i guess my answer to that would be that i try and make sure that i voice as compelling an argument for both sides of an issue as possible uh and then let the audience decide who they think is right i think you know one of the things i, I love about uh some of Oliver Stone's movies, like if you look at Platoon and Wall Street, uh, I think in Oliver Stone's eyes, Tom Berenger and Michael Douglas are the villains of those movies. But for a lot of people, you know, like I'll talk to, you know, buddies who are SEALs and they'll be like, oh yeah, Tom Berenger is the hero of Platoon. Or people on, you know, I was working as in investment banking after college, that number of people that would quote Gordon Gecko, And I'm like, I don't think you understood the movie. Like he's, the, the point of the movie isn't that greed is good. Right, <laughs> That's right. Like persuasive argument that greed uh, you know, drives American society towards good outcomes. And uh, so I think that's how I avoid it is making sure that I'm not arguing a certain point of view, but that I'm letting both points of views be argued emphatically and authentically. Yeah, the, I, I'm, 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 I think similar to that in, in a lot of ways. One thing that comes with it too is, is, is taking a character and making that character fully dimensional. Like Dylan Cross is a is when she, you know, she's a murderer, she's vicious, she has no mercy when it comes to it, but there are reasons for that. And so it's, it's, you can't just create a one dimensional killer. What fun is that? I mean, we have to, we have to get into why and who, and, and, and in, as the books go on, you're not creating a, a forgiveness for her, but you're creating an empathy. So the reader over time can understand uh, the motivations of why somebody turned out the way they did and decided to wreak havoc on the world the way they did. And so um, sometimes people ask me you know, about characters and, and, and you, you know, it's like you, it's good and evil. Yeah, well, there's good and evil, but there's a whole lot of gray in between, right? And, and, it, and the gray part is where we live and where we have to, we have to navigate and discern. And, and, and all of us has a bit of both good and evil in us, but, uh, and most of us live in that, in that gray area but certain people cross over, but why do they cross over? And I find the exploration of that, whether it's crime fiction or any kind of fiction, fascinating because it's the human condition, basically. So you, I mean, you've written, you know, quite a few books now, Jeff, and I'm sure you've learned which are the best practices for you at arriving in a character that you're really excited about writing versus times when it's just the cake isn't rising. Um, are there certain, do you have like a list of questions that you ask yourself to help bring a character to life or certain certain exercises that you go through when you're looking at somebody like Dylan and thinking, how do I not make her an archetype, but how do I make her this multifaceted character within her life? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, you, you really try to be empathetic and sympathetic even to your villain. And if you do that and you realize that you bring the good traits into her, but eventually the bad traits are going to be the ones that tug her toward her propulsion all the time, but you, you create this, this balance in character. And then, so when the moment comes, when, 
when it turns visceral and that balance swings way out of whack, the reader has some map of why of why that happened. So, mm -hmm. and I think in, in in writing the Dylan character was was really difficult because because of that and also because she was a woman. And so you have, I wanted to make sure I got that part of it right too. Um, and so it was a lot of, a lot of hand wringing, especially the last, the last few chapters of, uh, of Good Night Forever when, when Sam and Dylan finally, you know, make it to their, 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 uh, you know, their fatal, their fatal point. How does that lead up to that? And I, I almost want it to be like a date and that date slowly progresses to becoming very, very dangerous until, uh, you know, only one of them uh, walks out. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, I tend to always ask at the outset, what's, what's the circle that this person can't square in their life? What's that impossible conundrum for them that's gonna be like sort of beneath everything? Because that then helps me sort of have a sense of like, okay, how would I seed the notion that this conundrum exists without playing those cards face up quite yet, you know? And then that conundrum ultimately will drive their crisis point in the story and things like that. It's also a slow reveal in getting to that circle too, right? You don't want to, as you were saying, you want to you allow that to be unmasked gradually, but at the same time, connect it to everything that that person is about or experiences. That, that hidden thing beneath the surface is always there for him. Yeah, that, you know, what are the lies that the character tells themselves and what happens if they find out that those are lies when they believe them to be true? You know, I think for me with Knight, that was, he's a character who is lying to himself, who has built a whole, who's spent his whole life building this pattern of facts that he believes about where he fits into the world. And that starts to collapse over the course of the story. And that is a devastating thing for somebody to realize that they are not part of a solution in the world, but they're part of a problem in the world. Yeah, and our, our personal betrayals are what ultimately define us, right? I mean, that's, uh, and that's what we're all sort of battling against. Before we go, I just would love if you two could give us a preview on some of your upcoming projects, whether that be books or movies, whatever else. Feel free to plug any, anything that you're working on. Go, Will. Bye. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a little spread thin at the moment. Uh, I, have a, I have a sequel to Animals mapped out uh, that takes place in Eastern Congo uh, involving militias, uh, but I haven't gotten to write it yet because I've got uh, three TV shows that I'm working on at the moment. Um, as I mentioned, there's the Eddie Gallagher thing, I'm doing a, an adaptation of the book Norco 80 about the Norco bank heist uh, in an empire. I'm doing a, a spy show for Apple. Uh, and then a couple of movies, one's about African art restitution. Uh, and another one is the one I mentioned about the, uh, the Inupiaq story. Uh, so uh, at some point though, I'm dying to get back in and, uh, and get the next book going. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm somewhat preoccupied these days with uh, what's going on in the country and the world as, a, as editor of the foreign national section, but that's, uh, there's always, I, I love doing that. And it just, uh, every day I can kind of let the world in and decide how we want to cover that. So that takes a lot of time. But in the meantime, I'm, I started putting together uh, another novel uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mapping out now. It's, uh, uh, it, it won't be a straight up uh, crime. It will be, uh, be more of a, I'm just I'm, uh, entertaining the idea of, of having an assassin uh, and he's on his last assassination and he's headed toward that assassination through a, a winter storm. So he has to make stops doing it. And along the way, he unravels why he's doing what he's going to do and who the final person is and, and, and sort of what life means for him on this, uh, on this ultimate journey. So still being uh, sort of working out the kinks, but that's sort of the brief, uh, or the brief outlet view of it. One more thing to add. Jeff's book is out. Go buy it. It's awesome. I've read it twice. Yeah, paperback by this one guy's out too. <laughs> you guys took the words out of my mouth. That's exactly what I was going to say. You can buy these books at all major retailers. Um, I dropped the links in the chat. And yeah, as we're waiting for those new projects, please catch up. Read Goodnight Forever and read Animals. Thank you both so much for this amazing conversation. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Bye. Will. Thanks, Hannah. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to Blackstone Book Talks with Blackstone Publishing. 
If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest bookish news from Blackstone, you can follow us on Instagram at Blackstone Publishing, on Twitter and Facebook at Blackstone Audio, or on our website at blackstonepublishing.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.